Welcome to Missing Chronicles, where we delve into the heartbreaking and enigmatic mysteries surrounding disappearances. Here, we will immerse ourselves in the world of unsolved cases, thrilling search efforts, and intricate journeys. The goal of this channel is to spread awareness, foster community connections, and provide support to the families and loved ones of the missing. Join me as we embark on a suspenseful journey, hoping to uncover the truth behind these missing chronicles. Help us sustain and grow Missing Chronicles by becoming a patron on Patreon. Your contribution ensures that we can continue our investigations, share compelling stories, and work towards a world where no one is forgotten. Join us in making a lasting impact today. Vanished Without a Trace, The Mystery of Jennifer Kess' Disappearance Today, we're going to be covering the mysterious vanishing of Jennifer Kess, a young woman who had a promising career, a loving family, and boyfriend, only to disappear without any explanation 17 years ago in January of 2006. Jennifer Joyce Kess had just purchased her own condo in Orlando, Florida, and seemed to have everything going for her in her life. Jennifer worked as a finance manager at the Central Florida Investment Timeshare Company in Ocoee and was doing quite well in this profession. She was in a long-distance romantic relationship with a man named Rob Allen, who lived about three hours away from her home in Fort Lauderdale. The two were very serious about one another despite the distance between them, and Jennifer made sure to make time to see her boyfriend every single weekend. Jennifer Kess was well-liked by everyone who knew her and had no known enemies. She was successful and beautiful, and no one ever thought anything bad would happen to someone like her, someone who had the world at her fingertips and who was responsible and kind without a care in the world. In January of 2006, Jennifer and her boyfriend Rob took a trip together to St. Croix, which is a Caribbean island that's part of the Virgin Islands chain, in order for the two to spend some quality time together. Jennifer spent the night at his house upon their return on January 22. And she got up and left for work in the morning on the 23rd, just like she always did when spending time at his house. Nothing was unusual or out of the ordinary, and no one could have predicted the mystery and intrigue that was about to follow this seemingly perfectly ordinary day. She spoke to her mother that day, Jennifer told her she was on a cloud and had enjoyed her vacation very much. She was in great spirits and feeling good about her life, her career, and her relationship with Rob. Once she returned home from work that night, she spoke to her boyfriend, whom she had told she was heading off to bed soon after they finished speaking. But once that conversation ended, no one would ever hear from Jennifer Kess again. The next day, on January 25th, Jennifer never showed up for work, and she didn't call in either. She was a responsible person, and this was highly unusual for her. In addition, Jennifer did not call Rob in the morning like she normally would. In fact, he hadn't heard a single thing from her all day. Once her co-workers informed her parents that she hadn't shown up for work or called, her parents decided to go to her condo and make sure that she was okay. Once they got there, they let themselves inside with the spare key that she had given them and saw that the condo was neat and tidy, just how Jennifer always kept it, and that nothing was amiss and everything seemed perfectly normal. There was a t-shirt on the floor, her makeup was laid out on the counter, and the shower was still wet. This led her parents to believe that she'd in fact gotten herself ready for work and left to be on her way there that morning. There were seemingly no reasons as to why she hadn't ever arrived, though. Her purse, car keys, cell phone, and car were all missing right along with her, furthering the idea that she had left as usual that morning, so, what happened to Jennifer after she walked out of her front door and got into her car? That's exactly what her parents were wondering when they notified the police, who at first didn't think much of the whole situation and they also weren't taking it very seriously. They assumed she had taken off on her own and that she would be back soon enough with some tale to tell her family and boyfriend. Everyone who knew Jennifer didn't agree, though, and were very worried about where she could have been. When no one had heard from her again the next day, Jennifer was officially reported as missing. The police couldn't find any solid evidence that she had gone anywhere against her will, though, and therefore they still weren't too sure that anything was actually wrong. Two days after her parents had first gone to the police, 
Jennifer's car was found abandoned in the parking lot of the Huntington on the Green Apartment Complex at Americana in Texas, which is less than one mile from her condo. Residents of the Huntington told investigators that the vehicle had been parked there for several days, and they hadn't seen who had brought it there in the first place. Jennifer's car seemed to be in the same condition as her condo. There were no signs that a struggle had taken place, nothing was missing from the vehicle, and her very expensive radio and DVD player were still there and intact. It seemed as though she had simply driven her car to the parking lot, parked it in the spot where it was found, and then vanished off the face of the earth, upon further questioning of the residents of the apartment complex where Jennifer's car was found, the police could find no more information about who had brought it there or anything else involving Jennifer. They seemed to have hit a dead end already. Investigators seemed to have gotten their first lead when they started looking through surveillance footage from the day the car was left abandoned in the lot. Some of the footage showed an unidentified person who stood approximately 5 foot 4 inches tall, who parked the car and then sat inside of it for 30 seconds or so, then got out and walked away. Unfortunately, the stranger's face was obstructed by a fence post that seemed to only conceal their face, combined with a very poor quality of the footage itself. Every effort was made to enhance the footage, with it even being sent to NASA, but in the end, even that yielded no results. The person could not be identified despite the investigator's hard work and best efforts. It was very frustrating, Jennifer's car was searched thoroughly and gone through forensically, but only one latent fingerprint and the impression of a work boot was gotten from the intense efforts. Otherwise, no clues were left behind as to who had been driving her car that day, and the person remained a phantom on the periphery of the investigation, unable to be seen or otherwise identified despite the investigator's hard work and dedication into doing so. The vehicle was more than likely thoroughly wiped down. Jennifer's bank account remained untouched, and authorities were unable to ping her cell phone. It was almost as though she had evaporated into the ether. Her family, close friends, co-workers, and her boyfriend were all intensely questioned, but that turned up nothing useful either, the only thing that they could come up with was the fact that more than a few people told them that she had been complaining about constant harassment aimed at her by some of the construction workers who were working near her condo at the time of her disappearance. She reported that they had been making inappropriate and harassing comments towards her and catcalling her. She also told people that one of the managers at the building had made an advance towards her, but that she had declined him. Nothing new came up upon questioning all of these individuals. And police still were no closer than they were the very first day she had gone missing to uncovering the truth of what actually happened to her, there were some leads called in, but none of any substance, with people reporting that they had seen Jennifer's car driving erratically the day she went missing or that there had been strange men lurking around her apartment in the days leading up to her disappearance. But nothing ever came of any of it because none of it could be substantiated. In the end, they were left with nothing but rumors and speculation. No cold hard facts or tangible evidence have been gathered. Their main theory in those first few weeks was that Jennifer had been abducted by human traffickers. But this could never be proven either, the lead investigator on the case, Detective Joel Wright, said this of it all, I believe Jennifer got ready for work. She showered, got dressed, went outside of her condo, locked the door on the way out, and made it as far as her car. After that, I believe she was abducted. Eventually, a witness who lived in the same condo apartments as Jennifer would come forward and report that the man in the surveillance footage closely resembled a man she knew who had recently done some maintenance work in the building. He went by the name Chino, and it turned out he had done repairs in Jennifer's condo only a week before she disappeared. By the time this information came to light, Chino was already in prison for the unrelated charge of statutory assault and was easily interviewed, but he adamantly and very quickly denied any and all claims made that he had anything to do with Jennifer's disappearance. Due to the poor quality of the footage and the fact that Chino eventually passed a polygraph test, investigators could take this lead no further. They couldn't pursue him any longer at that point in time and therefore had to look elsewhere for answers as to what happened to Jennifer Kess on that fateful day. Jennifer would officially be declared as deceased in January of 2016, but her family fought that ruling. 
They also were in the middle of fighting the state of Florida to get access to the case files. And in March of 2019, they finally won that battle. However, even after pouring through 16,000 pages of documents and 67 hours of videotape, they're still no closer to getting any more information about what could have happened to Jennifer, let alone solving the case. The family continues to pursue this case using private investigators and any other available means in order to find out what happened to her. One of those PIs, named Michael Torretta, did manage to find a witness who reported having seen an unidentified male dumping a rolled-up piece of carpet into a lake near where Jennifer lived at the time of her disappearance. The divers were brought in, and they searched the lake thoroughly. Nothing was ever found, and the information ended up being just another in a long line of dead ends and false leads in this case, the Kessas never stopped searching for new clues and leads into Jennifer's disappearance and pursue each and every one of them as they come to their attention. But they are no further now than they ever were in discovering what happened to her that day almost 20 years ago. They have set up a Facebook page called Help Find Missing Jennifer Kess, which is on screen now, that is solely dedicated to sharing information and finding answers. Even with all the attention and determination by not only Jennifer's family and loved ones but from followers of the case and armchair detectives all over the internet, it still remains to be seen if whoever is responsible for her disappearance will ever be brought to justice and if the mystery of what happened to her will ever be solved. Thank you for watching Missing Chronicles. We have explored captivating stories and searched for answers behind the vanished. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay updated with our latest videos. Share these videos to spread the message and assist affected families and loved ones. If you have any information related to the cases we've discussed, please leave them in the comments section. Together, we can make a difference. See you in the next Missing Chronicles.